Hi, I'm Amy Cardoso and welcome to Art This Week. On this week's episode, we visit the Harry Ransom Center and our interviewer, Linda Mao, speaks with curator Jessica S. McDonald about the exhibition, Elliot Erwitt, Home Around the World. Now for Art This Week. I'm here speaking with curator Jessica McDonald about the exhibition Elliot Erwitt Home Around the World that's on view here at the Harry Ransom Center through January 1st. Jessica, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Thank you for your interest. So first of all, this exhibition features just an extraordinary number of objects and uh, most of them are sourced from the Harry Ransom Center's permanent collection. Would you say that this exhibition is to some degree a celebration of an exciting new acquisition? It absolutely is. So we were delighted to receive a gift of 47,500 photographs by Elliot Erwitt. And as a way to sort of get started understanding that collection and also as a way to invite others to do research here mm -hmm. in the collection, we've put together this exhibition really as a sort of an inaugural show mm -hmm. or an introductory an introduction. show. Mm -hmm. A lot of exhibitions of Erwitt's work have been curated around a central theme or a subject matter in a lot of cases, um, but this exhibition is structured really differently from that. Can you tell me how you went about selecting you know, some 200 objects from those 4,700? 47,000. Um, 47, <laughs> yeah. Objects. <laughs> how did you go about selecting them and then organizing them in the space? The challenge was really starting with the collection and then moving toward an exhibition that would really introduce the collection um, yeah. instead of starting with a theme and then finding objects that would support that theme. Mm -hmm. The theme was really the collection and Elliot Erwitt's entire career mm -hmm. and how to represent that entire body of work that is now here and available for research. Right. So it was really a lot of fun to look through the entire collection mm -hmm. and we've been working on this exhibition for probably about three years just looking at all of the work and trying to find connections mm -hmm. between all the different kinds of work he's done because he's a, a very well-known photographer of course has been working for decades but is known to some people as a photojournalist. They really know about his political coverage. And some people have very little awareness of that body right. of work, but know him as a photographer who is very fond of dogs. And some people right. are unfamiliar with the dog photographs and know him as somebody who has really excelled in advertising. And, and others know him for his photographs of his own family. And so there are people really familiar with various aspects of his career, but that can be challenging to make sense of. Mm -hmm. This all came out of one person and where yeah. are the threads that connect it all? Mm -hmm. And that was a bit of a puzzle. And this exhibition tries to suggest some of those connections. Mm -hmm. It's not answering that question. We hope that over the years, many researchers will dig into that question, but it's a, it's a good start. So would you say you may use uh, biography as a sort of tool to guide you in the organization? I think it was looking at different periods of his career, different um, sort of forays into new aspects of the career, mm -hmm. so sort of milestones in photojournalism for him, milestones um, in portraiture, uh, and also different periods in his life, especially in the very early years where he was trying to just um, make a living, mm -hmm. and what are the different aspects of um, a young photographer's career before he became a member of Magnum or became so very well known for his magazine work, what was he doing to put together. Right. So to that end, um, the exhibition's title, Home Around the World, suggests something of his early biography and also then when he's an established photographer, that biography. Can you tell me a little bit about his early life and his education? It's a very complicated story, but it's <laughs> one shared by many Americans of a certain generation, I think. So he um, was, he is the son of um, two Russians who had to leave Russia in 1917 because of the revolution. So his parents were sort of refugees who um, moved to, first to France and then to Italy. So he was born in France and then lived in Italy. Um, Italy wasn't a great place to be for a lot of people in the years leading up to the Second World War. Um, the family had to leave Italy, went to France for a year, but then had to leave Europe mm -hmm. um, and came to the United States in 1941, just before where right. they were, you know, became 
very problematic, especially if any part of your heritage was Jewish. He then was in New York for a bit until he went with his father sort of unexpectedly to California, to Los Angeles. He was at Hollywood High School and he took a class of some sort in high school and built a kind of a home darkroom in the, out of the laundry room and started making his own work. Um, and when he decided to think about what he wanted to do after high school, he went to Los Angeles City College. I went into the photography program there. It was a two-year college. He ended up meeting a lot of artists and poets and different interesting people who would hang out at his house. He was very interested in filmmaking and in still photography. Um, he has this very interesting memory of a photographer, a life photographer, coming to campus to do a feature on Los mm -hmm. Angeles City College and him thinking, you know, I guess I could be a photographer for a living. It's right. not just for artists mm -hmm. who um, live sort of, you know, a, a little bit of an, an unstable life. Again, there, there's, there's stable work to be had working for the magazines. He seems to have never been very fond of Los Angeles, despite growing up for, some, for, for a few years there and um, was eager to get back to New York. And so he also knew that New York was the center of publishing for all of the big picture magazines and went there. Um, at the same time, he enrolled in some courses, um, possibly sort of casually as an auditor in filmmaking at the New School for Social Research. So he was surrounded by um, intellectuals. Um, he was very interested in Italian neorealism mm -hmm. in terms of his cinematic interests and um, his early photographs of that period I think reflect that. So in 1950 is a really important year professionally for Erwitt. He gets three of his photographs are acquired by MoMA and there are some pursuant uh, professional opportunities for him. Can you talk a little bit about the early 50s and Erwitt's professional life? That's an interesting time because he had moved to New York and was trying to put together work. Um, he was on his own as a very young man and like a lot of young photographers had been showing his work around to the kind of key figures mm -hmm. in New York. So of course Edward Steichen at the Museum of Modern Art, Alexei Brodovich at Harper's Bazaar. Um, he met John Morris at Ladies Home Journal mm -hmm. um, and eventually did some work for Roy Stryker, the very famous head of the FSA project who was then at um, Standard Oil. Um, and he was also making a lot of author's portraits for publishers in New York. And um, through his connection to Roy Stryker, ended up leaving New York briefly to, do, um, to, be, to become part of the team working on the Pittsburgh Photographic Library under the um, supervision, under the head of the supervision of Roy Stryker, who left Standard Oil to go and do that project. Um, so some of his best-known photographs are, were made um, during those few months that he was in Pittsburgh. He ended up getting drafted into the United States Army straight out of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. So that was a sh sort of a short-lived project, but one that um, is very important to him as a, um, probably the first period in his life that he was hired to take photographs um, by walking around all day, meeting people, looking at um, looking at the city, and that's something that he ended up doing later um, in, in a more um, systematic way, maybe, right. but something he's known for is his street photographs, and so when he was in Pittsburgh, he was hired to be photographing a changing city, so the context is a, a little bit different there, right. but um, all of those things probably added up to his um, sort of toolkit mm -hmm. for when he got out of the army. So the exhibition includes several um, magazine page layouts mm -hmm. and even some mm -hmm. amazing examples of contact sheets with his own little doodles yes. on them. Can yeah. you tell me a little bit about these objects and their presentation in the exhibition? Well, I think it's useful when you're studying somebody's entire career and, and you know some of the really famous images to understand the original reason that photograph was taken mm -hmm. and the original context. And so um, contact sheets are a very important way of doing that. Seeing the frame that the photographer selected, but then seeing all the frames around it, it can be useful for information. Mm -hmm. You can possibly provide a very specific location or identify the setting in a way that you right. can't from that particular photograph. But it can also show you how the photographer moved through that scene, um, how they made particular decisions about um, which way to situate 
themselves in terms of their relationship with the subject and what they decide to actually photograph. But it's also very interesting at the end to, to see which one was selected. Right. And as is often the case, as is shown in this exhibition, the, the frame that he selected might be different from the frame that the picture editor selected right. or um, you know, the person working for the magazine or the client in mm -hmm. one way or another selected. And so there are several mm -hmm. examples in this exhibition of um, the published version, the selected frame, and then the variant that he preferred right. or found was more to his, um, served his purposes better, right. he just liked better. And so we've got several contact sheets that are um, presented next to the finished right. um, photograph that he chose. In regards to that, as a, talking a little bit about his selection process and also him not always agreeing with um, the magazine editors, can you tell me a little bit more about the two photos that are Douglas, Wyoming in 1954? When Elliot Erwitt was a new member of Magnum, the photo agency that um, was formed in 1947 to really bring together these talented photographers and um, protect their rights, I guess, in an age where they were working for the magazines. Um, he was part of a group assignment. So Magnum sent photographers out to different countries around the world to photograph children who were born just at the end of the Second World War. So by this time, 1954, they were all, you know, nine, ten years old. And his job was to photograph the American child. So he didn't have to go very far, but he right. ended up <laughs> taking this road trip out west because um, somewhere along the line, an editor felt that an American child should be represented by a child who lives on a ranch, right? right. So it can't be a New York kid or a Midwestern kid. <laughs> right. It has to be a ranch kid, right? The sort of American cowboy fantasy. Sure. <laughs> so he drives out to Wyoming and he meets this young boy somehow um, and gets connected with this boy who lives on a ranch. But the scenario is a little bit less than ideal, he finds out. Um, the boy lives with his grandparents because his grandparents live in town, which is where the school is. His mother has left the family for circumstances we're not quite sure of, and um, the boy's father has to be out in the ranch lands all week, just comes back on Sundays to have dinner with the family. So the boy is very, very lonely. Mm -hmm. um, photographs of him are, um, you know, they often feature him sort of playing with his dog alone or wandering around sort of by himself or interacting with the various animals on the farm. Um, and then there's a, a, a very um, poignant photograph of the boy. The father has come back for the Sunday dinner and the father's eyes are sort of tearing up. Um, and that photograph has ended up meaning a great deal to Elliot because he remembers being sort of a lonely boy himself as an only child and one kind of constantly uprooted. Mm -hmm. The editors of Holiday felt it was too sad. They didn't accept it. It was not... Um, accepted for the assignment. So they made him go out and photograph a different ranch boy. So this time he went to Colorado and found um, a boy around the same age, but someone who was smiling right. constantly in every frame. He's mm -hmm. just grinning. He's just delighted with this wonderful life he's got. And that was the one that was accepted mm -hmm. by the magazine and published. In typical Elliot Erwitt style, um, the other story, his original story that he preferred was published later because he sort of pitched it to various publications. Through Magnum, he was able to keep the rights to all right. of his work. So he had control over that story and those photographs um, and was able to publish it in various other contexts. Um, and, and sort of interesting, the boy in Colorado who was published um, was photographed again by Elliot Erwitt not too long ago as an adult, um, a ma another magazine sent, sent him back to kind of redo this story that was so well known from the 1950s. So finally, mm. last thing I want to talk about is um, the subject of film. So mm -hmm. the, yes. the topic or the, the interest Elliot Erwitt has in film is seen throughout his work. Can you tell me about some examples of, of the way we see that interest reflected in some of the still photography? Very early on, back to his days in Los Angeles, Elliot, er Elliot Erwitt was very interested in film. I think it's um, likely that most children growing up in Hollywood would, right. would, ha would be aware, at least, of film. Mm -hmm. um, but he was never very interested in big Hollywood pictures. He was very interested in 
quieter European films. He was very interested in Italian films, um, and especially neorealism, which was very much kind of the opposite of the big Hollywood picture. Mm -hmm. So instead of a sound stage, it was all um, filmed outdoors instead of professional actors with wardrobe and hair. It was just sort of normal people mm -hmm. um, playing these roles in the clothing they came on set wearing. Right. Um, it, they often focused instead of on um, happy endings and you know wonderful love stories and everything's great and the big American dream. It was often sort of gritty stories of well, World War II had just destroyed a lot of Europe, including a lot of Italy, and, it, and um, there was great poverty, um, children were orphaned. I mean, it wasn't, it was, it was a devastating situation right. for many, and um, there was widespread unemployment, there were veterans of the war who were disabled, um, there, it was just, um, uh, there was a lot to um, bring to the attention of people who would watch these films, and mm -hmm. so Erwitz work in the late 40s and early 50s takes on more of an interest in people on the street. Mm -hmm. Maybe not just beautiful people posing for portraits, right. but um, people on the street who were experiencing post-war alienation and isolation and, and sort of alone in a crowd. Mm -hmm. um, people who were trying to ask for money from other people because they were blind or had other, you know, um, reasons why they couldn't work. And so the nitty gritty realities of New York mm -hmm. were, um, I, were of some concern to him mm -hmm. at this point. We I think also... his ongoing interest in filmmaking was mediated by practical concerns. Okay. So when He's studying film at the New School for Social Research and then eventually goes into the army. In that period when he's in the army, he meets the woman who would marry and they immediately have a child. And so he has to do something that he knows he can do immediately to make a living for his new young family. And so I think that any dreams of being an independent filmmaker were put on hold a little bit mm -hmm. just because of a very immediate practical concerns. He wanted to be a very responsible person and, right. and take care of his family. I don't think that that desire to make films went away. Mm -hmm. I think it was just sort of put to the side. And in those decades, in the 1950s and 60s, the, especially in the 1950s, the principal way that most Americans at least saw experienced, absorbed images of world events or even nearby events was through picture magazines mm -hmm. and photographs in newspapers. Um, you know, in the 50s, not every household had a television yet. So if you wanted to know what was happening um, anywhere, it was really through re photographs reproduced. That kept a lot of photographers in business for mm -hmm. a really long time. There was a great demand for that. When television started to draw ad revenues away from printed publications, um, Erwitt was able to direct more of his energy back toward motion pictures in various ways through, you know, um, even some television commercials, mm -hmm. but through his own independent films at first and also through some um, projects he made as his own producer and editor and director, um, but eventually ending up on um, HBO and mm -hmm. cable television. Um, so the way that photography has sort of changed and gone through its own various tr transitions also is reflected in his career. He, he, he was very happy to take that opportunity to start making films once right. um, that's the way the field kind of moved. Some of the earlier films he did um, in the early 70s I think are reflective of some of the stories he really wanted to tell. So there are films about um, aspiration and success or failure, so young women trying out for a sort of a dance team or um, young men and women trying out for an elite marching band um, and then you follow certain people through and see who kind of gets in and who doesn't so it's this very human tale of you know devastating failure or <laughs> wonderful triumph you know um, these kind of universal stories Later on, I think he, um, 
I don't know if it's just the context changed or he sort of um, felt a little bit more freedom or he had, he had just gone a direction where he was working with a, um, a journalist, Murray Sale, and they just made a really um, ridiculous set of films um, called The Great Pleasure Hunt, where they would travel all around the world and um, experience things that only the very wealthy could experience. So sitting in a golden bathtub for good luck in Japan for an extraordinary amount of money and, and Murray Sale in the bathtub with a calculator calculating how much it's costing for him to be sitting here right now with this microphone um, probably plugged into something electrical while he's in the bathtub but um, just a, a very purposely um, sort of ridiculous um, really fun group mm -hmm. of films there that reflect what we think of I, I think um, as sort of his comedic approach to both moving and still photography mm -hmm. during a certain period, yeah. So the exhibition does really focus on this influence of film that's really maybe underreported in some of his other exhibitions. And even the catalog features an essay that really delves into the, the influence of film and the actual films of mm -hmm. Elliot Erwitt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something um, that I thought was really important is to look at the entire scope of his career. And there are periods of time when he's really looking at film. So there are periods where um, you can trace. He, he never stops photographing. I mean, he, he even in the parts of his life when he makes the fewest photographs, it's still more than many professional photographers make. I mean, he's incredibly right. productive. Um, but there are periods where you can tell that his main emphasis is on motion pictures of one kind mm -hmm. or another. And I thought that that was a really important thing to include, especially since most exhibitions of photographs of, of his that I've seen or, or encountered, or, and, and his books too, they, they don't really address the filmmaking aspect of his career, which started, I mean, in his teens and you know, continues. Uh, so um, one of the essays in the book um, really addresses his interest in film, the way it impacts his still photographs, and also um, really breaks down all of the films he made and talks about them in some depth. And that was written by a colleague of mine, um, Sean Corcoran, who is the curator of photographs at the Museum of the City of New York. Excellent. So again, the show runs through January 1st. That's right. Um, and thank you again so much for speaking with me today. Thanks a lot. It's been fun. We want to thank Jessica for speaking with us. For more information on the exhibition, go to hrc.utexas.edu. That's it for this week. Thanks for watching. I still got your polar